Okay, so we're going to start with chapter 22 for Bio 112. And um, this chapter is going to have to do with evolution. So um, we're going to talk about evolution a lot in this class. And um, we're going to start out by talking about the father of evolution, who is Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin is going to be the guy who went over to the Galapagos Islands. And if you see this picture here, this kind of shows that um, area that he went. So you can see that um, he was mapping out the coastline, mostly of South America. And then he ended up over here, and that's the Galapagos Islands. So he saw some stuff while he was there, and um, mostly he was looking at the birds. And that's what made him question his ideas about evolution. So one word that he came up with, what you know, uh, as far as this concept goes, is adaptation. And adaptations are going to be things that basically help an organism do three things, either reproduce, survive, or eat, right? So what I mean by survive is avoid being eaten, right? So those are the three things that organisms are going to be put on this earth to do, to eat, avoid being eaten, and reproduce. So adaptations are going to be things that will help them to do one of those three things. So we'll get into that a little bit um, later. So from his studies, he came up with these four observations of nature. First one is that members of the population is, are going to vary greatly in their traits. So what that means is if you look around at school, right, you can see that there's a bunch of um, human beings walking around. And we definitely don't all look the same, but we are one species. Same thing here. If you look at these finches, um, you can see that there's a lot of different varieties in the way that they look. You can see that um, they have different beaks depending on what they eat. And so they're all going to be finches, but there's a lot of variation, right? So um, these different types of beaks are going to be what are called adaptations. They're going to help them to do whatever it is they need to do. So obviously a seed eater is going to have that big wide beak. An insect eater is going to have that pointy beak so that it can get into little crevices. And then a cactus eater is going to have kind of a medium sized beak. Um, if you look at this picture, you can definitely see how variation occurs within a species. So this is all one species of snail, but you can see they all look a little bit different. And in certain situations, it might be more, more beneficial to have this phenotype, and in others, it might be beneficial to have that one. So we'll get into that a little bit more, too, when we get into how that actually works. Um, the next part he came up with, our traits are inherited from parents to the offspring. So that's just going to be talking about um, in the DNA. Um, the next one, all species are capable of producing more offspring than the environment can support. So what that means is that actually goes on to the next one, saying that they can keep reproducing and reproducing, but what's going to happen is you're going to end up with lack of food or resources of some type, whether it be sunlight, room in the ground, um, water, whatever that resource is. And so some of those offspring are not going to survive. So when that happens, that's when you're going to end up with competition. And competition is going to be what the basis of evolution is. So then he went a little bit further and he came up with these two inferences. First one is that individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing are going to leave more offspring than others. So that's basically put is just that if you can survive by avoiding being eaten and by being able to eat, you're going to have a greater chance of producing offspring. Pretty logical. Um, then this next one, the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce is going to lead to accumulation of differences in a population over generations. So the example I always give in class is about fish that they found in caves that have no eyes. So they have eye sockets, but they don't have eyes anymore. So one school of thought said, well, maybe those fish actually did that because it was too much energy to produce the eyes and they weren't using them. So if you don't use them, you lose them. However, when you think about how Darwin was talking, and this is the most widely accepted idea about evolution, he said maybe there was variation in that population. So if we think about a population of fish living in a cave, maybe some of them could see and some couldn't. Well, if you lose a sense, what happens to your other senses? They become more acute, right? So you've got these fish that can't see, but their other senses are going to be increased. So what's going to happen is they're probably going to have better luck at finding food, avoiding predators, and finding a mate. So what's going to happen is whatever's in their DNA that made them have either no eyes or be blind 
that's going to get passed on to the next generation. Whereas the other ones you can see are sitting there floating around like, where the hell is the food? Freaking out, right? And they're going to die and they're not going to have a chance to pass on their genes as often as that group. And so eventually that population is going to change. So that's kind of how um, evolution works as far as what Darwin thinks. Okay, so we know that genes are going to vary within a population. And um, that's what Charles Darwin kind of based his theories on. And two things that he came up with are going to be evolution and natural selection. So evolution is going to be how something changes through time, right? So we could say my waistline evolved over, over the holiday season, which it did, unfortunately. It changed. It got bigger, right? So um, when we talk about biological evolution, that's talking about species accumulating differences over time and eventually end up with a new species being formed. Um, so that was one theory that Darwin came up with. The second theory he came up with was natural selection, and a very common term used with that is survival of the fittest. So basically that's saying that we've got evolutionary change coming from um, certain individuals out competing others, and that's because they have certain characteristics. Um, so there's a couple of really important things when we talk about natural selection. First one is that um, it's very easy for people to think of individuals as evolving. Like if I told you to think of the ultimate picture that is used widespread of evolution, you're going to picture probably the monkey and then it turns into a human, right? And that's a little bit misleading because that makes you think that one day a monkey just said, hey guys, have you tried standing up? It's pretty easy. And then everybody just started standing up. And that's not how it happened. That idea with the fish where you just have that um, evolutionary advantage and those ones are reproducing with one another, that's more how it happens. So it's happening at a population level, not individual level. Um, the second thing is that natural selection is only going to be able to work on heritable traits. So it has nothing to do with what you do over a lifetime. It only has to do with what's in your DNA and what's helping you to survive. So um, with that being said, there was a competing theory that was brought about by a guy named Lamarck. And Lamarck was actually widely accepted. A lot of people thought Darwin was crazy. And um, his example of what he thought was called the inher inheritance of acquired characteristics. And basically that's stating that individuals are going to pass characteristics onto their offspring that they have acquired over a lifetime. So the example that we use for this is the giraffe. So we know that the giraffe's um, ancestors had a shorter neck. And so the idea was, well, how did this giraffe get this really long neck? So what Lamarck said is that every day that giraffe stretched and stretched because that's where his food was, and eventually he got a really long neck. So basically that got accumulated over a lifetime and then that passed on to the next generation. So right now that should be sending some red flags off to you because we just said that it only can work on heritable traits, things that are in your DNA. Stretching your neck every day, that's not in your DNA. And to give you an example of how far-fetched that is, basically that would be like me saying, okay, I'm going to have a baby. And while I'm pregnant, I am going to work out like crazy, like psycho workout. I'm also going to go to the tanning salon every day, and when I give birth, I'm going to have a really muscular, tan baby, like a little mini Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So that. Um, first of all, that's super creepy. Second of all, impossible, because I don't have that stuff in my DNA. That's just stuff that I was doing over my lifetime. So um, another idea that Lamarck came i got to get rid of that picture. It's freaking me out. <laughs> another idea that he came up with is the use and disuse idea. So he said things that you use all the time get stronger and get passed on more than things that you don't use. So the whole use it or lose it idea. Um, obviously, once again, that has nothing to do with what's in your DNA. So that was also rejected. So he was actually quite popular. A lot of people agreed with what he said for a long time. Um, but then once Darwin started proving or, you know, coming up with some evidence for his theories, that's when people kind of said, ah, I don't know about this Lamarck guy. And then obviously with these examples I've given you, it's kind of made sense. So in the second part, we're going to talk about um, types of evolution and then some other evidence we have of evolution out there.